welcome to Bethel. Thank you very much for coming. Just a few thank yous before we start. I want to thank uh, staff at Bethel, especially our executive director, Eric Levoy, for putting everything together. Also, I really want to thank our Israel coordinator, Judy Persky, standing in the back, who really put the whole program together. Judy got married yesterday. <laughs> and, and what a better way to spend your honeymoon <laughs> than uh, with all of us here together. Yeah. I also want to thank um, all the volunteers, all the donors who made the evening possible. Uh, our question screeners, Joe Schumann and Judy, Judy Persky, and also Audrey Jacobs is a, a question screener. Uh, Audrey worked very hard also in putting this together. I'll say just a quick shout out about Audrey. So Audrey, many of you know, has been our director of Stand With Us, a really important Israel advocacy group in town. And uh, we've worked together closely for many years. And sadly, she's leaving that position. Um, but uh, she's taking another position and always giving incredible energy to every, anything she does. So I want to take this time to thank Audrey for everything she's done. I guess she is. For, for Israel, but, but also for Bethel. <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, and thank you all for coming. There's a story in the Talmud where Rabbi Yochanan's great friend and study partner, Rachel Lakish, passes away. And uh, Rabbi Yochanan is mired in grief. So his friends and the rabbis decide they'll get him a new friend, sort of like when a, a pet dies and, and you replace the, the dead pet with a new pet. They figure, it, okay, we'll get him a new friend. So uh, they find him a new friend. Oh, everyone, please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> Some sign language going on in the back. I figured it out. Please turn off your cell phones. So uh, Rabbi Yochanan's friend dies. They find him a new friend, study partner. And they sit down to study together. And every time Rabbi Yochanan says anything, the uh, new study partner says, you're 100% correct. I agree with you completely. Or I have a, uh, I know a teaching that agrees with you completely. So Rabbi Yochanan goes through this for a little while and he gets very upset. He says, you think you're, you're my study partner, my friend? And when Reish Lakish, who was the old study partner, when we would study together, he would always tell me why I'm wrong. He would always challenge me. Now I'm telling you that I'm right. I know I'm right. I, I need someone to tell me when I'm wrong. So then uh, they go back and forth for a while, and Rabbi Yochanan is so mired in grief that he dies of despair. And the point of the story becomes, without a friendship that challenges, the questions, life really isn't worth living. There's another phrase in the Talmud, o chavruta, o mituta, either friendship or death. But the friendship that we know of in the Talmud is this chavruta, the study partner, the one who challenges the one who forces us to question our assumptions. And the Talmud tells us without that kind of friendship, then life isn't worth living. So we come together tonight as friends, this is my naive hope, to uh, discuss what is certainly the most important issue in world Judaism today and the issue that's facing American Judaism, Judaism the, the Judaism that's not in Israel how exactly we articulate our support for Israel. And we can do that as opponents, or we can do it as friends. So my faith tonight is that we do it as friends. We have a healthy exchange of arguments and a discussion, but we do it with civility, with a sense of respect, and we come to a higher synthesis together, and we continue living together as a community. That's my naive hope, but I'm allowed to think and hope naively as the rabbi of this community. And that's part of what we believe in here. So some quick round rules before we start. Um, each, uh, we, we, we flipped a coin just a few moments ago. <laughs> and uh, to decide who's going to speak first, I'll tell you that in a second. Um, we're going to have time after the presentation for questions and answers. But we're only taking written questions. So I think on, on your way in, you probably received cards and pencils. And if you don't, then there's ways to get them. And uh, while the presentation is going on, you can start writing down questions, and then our question screeners are going to be going, other ushers too are going to be going up and down and collecting them. They'll give them to the screeners. They are screening for civility and brevity. 
brevity may be even more important than civility. So that, that's actually a question and, uh, and not a sermon, not a comment. I see some people are writing, they're already writing down. <laughs> you can't possibly have any questions for what I said, but um, all right. <laughs> if, if there's already any questions, that's okay. We can start already. But really, you should be addressing them to, uh, to our guests, and I'll be reading them, and we'll have some time for that. All right, um, Rabbi, Rabbi Gordis, Dr. Gordis uh, won the, the coin flip, so I'm going to call up uh, a great community leader who's going to introduce uh, Dr. Gordis. It's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and uh, the president of the Friends of the IDF in the United States and uh, a great uh, warrior on behalf of the Jewish people in Israel, Julian Josephson. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Uh, the rabbi has admonished me to um, read purely from the script and not to uh, wander around the uh, corners of the hall. So um, he has spent about two weeks doing that, so I intend to do just that. Um, so it's my privilege and pleasure this evening to introduce uh, Dr. Gordas to all of you. Many of you in this audience already know or have heard of Dr. Gordas. Some of you might have even have heard him speak, read his articles. Um, he's a scholar in his own right, and for those of you that don't know him, I'm going to read you his uh, bio, which is very, very impressive. So bear with me just for a few seconds. So Dr. Gordas is a senior vice president of the Shalom Center and a correct distinguished fellow at the Shalom Center in Jerusalem. He's a regular columnist for the Jerusalem Post and a frequent contributor to the New York Times, in print and online. The author of numerous books on Jewish thought and current events in Israel and a recent winner of the National Jewish Book Award, Dr. Gordas was the founding dean of the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies at the University of Judaism, the first rabbinical college on the west coast of the United States. Dr. Gordas joined Shalem in 2007 to help found Israel's first liberal arts college after spending nine years as vice president of the Mandel Foundation in Israel and a director of its leadership institute. Dr. Gordas is widely cited on matters pertaining to Israel. Professor Alan Dershowitz has called him one of Israel's most thought thoughtful observers, while Jeffrey Goldberg of The Atlantic has written, if you ask me, of all the people you know, who cares the most about the physical, moral, and spiritual health of Israel, I would put the commentator and scholar, Dr. Gordas, at the top of the list. Since moving to Israel in 1998, Dr. Gordas has written and lectured throughout the world on Israeli society and the challenges facing the Jewish state. His writings have appeared in magazines and newspapers, including the New York Times, the New Republic, the New York Times Magazine, Moment, Tikkun, Azure, Commentary Magazine, and Conservative Judaism. His book, Saving Israel, How the Jewish People Can Win a War That May Never End, was published by Wiley in March of 2009 and was subsequently awarded the 2009 National Jewish Book Award. Dr. Gordas's most recent book, co-authored with Dr. David Ellison of the Hebrew Union College, is entitled Pledges of Jewish Allegiance, Conversion, Law, and Policymaking in 19th and 20th Century Orthodox Responsa, and was released by Stanford University Press in December 2011. His next book, the Promise of Israel, Why Its Seemingly Greatest Weakness is Actually Its Greatest Strength, was published by Wiley in 2012. Dr. Gordas received his BA from Columbia, Columbia College, magna cum laude, and Phi Beta Kappa, a master's degree in rabbinic ordination from the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, and his PhD from the University of Southern California. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gordas. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you, Rabbi Grobart, not only for the uh, gracious invitation to be here tonight, but for putting together this entire event. I imagine that uh, Jeremy and I both share your sense that if we can engage each other in conversation that uh, both uh, clarifies and elucidates disagreements and perhaps gets some of us to rethink a little bit our own positions, uh, that in itself is a win for everyone. And um, I'm personally very grateful to be here tonight, and I thank all of those in the audience who I know worked very hard to make that possible. The good news and bad news about going first is, uh, the good news is you get to go first. Uh, the bad news is you have to go first. Which means that I'm going to assume some things about, uh, we're going to call each other first names, are we okay with that? Okay, great. So I'm going to assume some things about Jeremy's argument based on 
the conversations that we've had a little bit and the extensive reading of his work that I've done over the course of the years. Uh, you may choose to reframe exactly what it is that you think and say that um, what I've said is not exactly uh, what you hold now or ever did, and we'll, we'll see how that goes out. But here's the I want to actually tell you the five or so basic points that I want to make, and then I will go ahead and try to make them. First thing, the point that I want to make is that I think actually uh, Jeremy and I actually want the same thing to unfold in the Middle East. There are people who could be at the podium who would disagree with him, who see or foresee or would like a very, very different eventuality. For those of you who would like to have people at radically opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of what their desideratum is, you're going to be disappointed tonight because I think we actually want something very, very similar. Um, where we disagree is on the following issues. I think you think peace is possible and I think peace is not possible. I think that you think that to the extent that peace is possible, the, new, the move needs to be made by Israel, but Israel has been resistant. And therefore, the best way to move, or an, or an essential component of moving the peace process forward is to pressure Israel. And finally, I want to make it, or try to make it clear why I think that such pressure on Israel actually not only doesn't work, but actually makes peace infinitely less likely. My bottom line disagreement with you is not what we want to see in the Middle East. It's that I actually think you are making what we want to see in the Middle East less likely, not more likely, and I know you don't agree with that. So, uh, we will jump right in. What do we both want? I think what we both want, and again, we'll see, we'll clarify as we go back and forth. We both want a strong, secure, Jewish and democratic state of Israel. We both would like Israel to get out of some considerable portion of what is commonly called the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, the area over the Green Line, the area over the 1949 Armistice Line, the stuff over there. I'm going to call it the West Bank tonight. Please do not write a question about why didn't you call it Judea and Samaria, because West Bank has fewer syllables. Um, I think Jeremy and I both would think that it's good for Israel's democracy ultimately to try to get rid of a lot of that land. Um, perhaps we would disagree a little bit on the borders, but I think the borders are, are really the, the small piece of this. Um, we would like to see Israel at peace with its neighbors. Israel make serious territorial concessions in order to be able to do that. Have Jews live their lives in the state of Israel. Have Palestinians raise their children, their grandchildren in some state, the nature of which we'll talk about a little bit later on. About that, I think we basically agree. Here's where we disagree. I have, uh, people ask me all the time, what has been the most difficult part of making Aliyah? And I think they expect me to say something like having your children go to the army, um, having one car instead of two, living in a house that's a third of the size of what you had in the States. All the things that people expect you to say are not really the answer. For me, the most painful part of the last 15 years, which have been a glorious 15 years, has been the collapse of my hopes for peace. I was raised in one of those suburban democratic Jewish families where we actually didn't know any Republicans. We read about them, but we did not know them. I literally did not know a Republican even through the first two years of college. I, I sort of, you know, like African Aborigines. I knew they were out there somewhere, but I actually never really met one. And my parents raised me to believe that all conflicts basically could be resolved because people want the same thing. They want their children and their grandchildren to grow up more secure, more this, more that. And if people make accommodations and reach, you know, say this, this side gives up this, this side gives up that, everything can be worked out. For me, the most difficult, painful, devastating dimension of the last 15 years has been getting pulled, pulling and screaming, or, you know, to the, uh, to the conclusion that basically that's unfortunately not true. But unfortunately, I do not believe that peace with the Palestinians can be made now. That does not mean that Israel should have carte blanche to do whatever it wants. That does not mean that Israel doesn't need to be very smart about what it does in the interim. But I don't believe that the deal can be made. Why? First, partly because of history. We all know that the Palestinians and the Arabs, which I'm going to conflate for a second, and I know they're not exactly the same thing, but they turned it down a deal in 1937 with the Peel Commission. They turned down a deal in 1947 with the Partition Plan. After the 1967 war in which they were routed, they went to Khartoum and came back and said, no peace, no recognition, no negotiations. In 1973, once again, they came back and said, no deal. When Bibi Netanyahu did institute the first building freeze that President Obama asked him to institute, and there was no building for about nine to ten months anywhere in Judea and Samaria, for those of you who want to hear those terms, Abbas lost his number. 
He couldn't seem to get in touch. At the point that he actually got the building freeze that he wanted, he actually was unable to find Bibi Netanyahu. I don't even want to see Bibi Netanyahu and I end up seeing him all the time, so I don't think he's that actually very hard to find. There's lots more evidence that we obviously can't adduce in the first opening passage, but I just want to read you something from Nabil Shaf on Palestinian TV in July 2011, which makes it not prehistoric, it makes it about 18 months ago on, for those of you who follow Palestinian television closely, on the ANB TV station. I'm sure you get it on one of your 4,000 cable stations. This is what Nabil Shaf had to say, and I'm quoting him directly. The story of two states for two peoples means that there will be a Jewish people over here and a Palestinian people there. We will never accept this not as part of the French initiative and not as part of the American initiative. We will not sacrifice the 1.5 million Palestinians with Israeli citizenship. That's Israeli Arabs. We will not sacrifice the 1.5 million Palestinians with Israeli citizenship who live within the 1948 borders, and we will never agree to a clause preventing Palestinian refugees from returning to their country. We will not accept this, whether the initiative is French, American, or Czechoslovakian. Here's my basic question, and I mean it with every ounce of seriousness that I can muster. Why don't you believe him? I think that what it means to take somebody seriously is when they say something seriously to believe them. He says there's never going to be a deal. They believe him. Why don't you believe him? Because I do. Another point, of course, is that we would only have a deal if only the Israelis were somewhat more forthcoming. Um, there's a lot to say about these current Israeli elections, obviously, but one of the things that these Israeli elections actually prove is that in a time of great distress, when it looks like Iran's going to get the bomb, and Iran's going to get the bomb either because the Obama administration is going to completely fail to prevent it, just as the United States prevented Korea from getting a bomb, you can all remember Democratic and Republican presidents saying Korea will never be allowed to get a bomb. That was a great success. Or Iran could get a bomb because Korea could give them a bomb, which nobody ever thinks about. If Iran is going to get a bomb. That seems to me to be patently obvious. And in the face of that, and in the face of the fact that Israelis understand that Nabil Shaf speaks for an enormous swath of the Palestinian population and that there is not going to be a deal, who do Israelis actually vote for? They clipped Bibi's wings. They did not vote for Naftali Bennett. They voted for Yair Lapid, who actually ran on a platform mostly about domestic issues, but did say on his platform, and it's still on the web, you can go see it, that we should go back to the negotiating table. Not so we can reach a deal, actually, frankly, but so we can actually show the world that we're not the obstacles to peace. But nonetheless, Israelis voted for somebody who wanted to go back to the deal, to the table. And if you look at the division of the Knesset in the new, in the new makeup, the left wing and right wing blocks are basically equally sized. And the truth of the matter is, since Shas and the Haredi parties have only one platform, which is their schools, their institutions, their budgets, they are actually part of either the left wing or the right wing, depending on how, whichever the way the winds are blowing. So there's more than half of the Knesset that is actually interested in at least going back to the table, if not making a deal. And therefore, I have to say with all due candor, that there is something a tiny bit condescending about an American group telling us that the way to get us to go to the table is that it's going to go to D.C. and pressure congressmen to pressure us. It's like we are the natives in the loincloths and the spears who grunt every time we see an Arab, and they're going to teach us that it's not nice to grunt, that we should put down our spears, that we should wear more than loincloths, and if we could only dress more nicely and come to the table, we would have peace. Uh, but Israelis voted for peace again, and what we do not need, it seems to me, is more encouragement from the outside to do what we already do on our own. Now, there's another premise here, of course, which is that the, the, the best way to move peace forward is to actually go to D.C., find those congressmen, congresswomen, other leaders of this country who are more prone or open to being pressured or their disposition is more in that direction, and to begin to turn the screws on Israel. And it happens in all sorts of ways. It's an endorsement of the Goldstone Report. It's in telling Israel in Operation Cast Lead already in the first days of the, of the uh, war that it was time to get out. It was in trying to convince congresswomen and men not to vote for a resolution, which was a bipartisan resolution, actually calling for Congress to condemn the murder of the Fogel family in Itamar. Can't condemn the murder of a family? I know it took place over the line. But why do we have to actually object to Congress saying that murdering a whole Jewish family in cold blood in their bed is wrong? There's all sorts of different kinds of ways of putting pressure. We can talk about Hegel later tonight if we want. Um, it's a bigger issue to other people than it is to me. But that kind of pressure, it seems to me, 
presupposes, A, that Israelis need to be pressured, which I think is wrong, that a deal can be made, and I think is wrong, and it does something much, much more dangerous. I'm one of those old-fashioned dinosaurs. I actually think that values matter. I think that truth matters, and I think that justice matters. And as much as I would like peace, I've got two kids in the army, both of whom I wish were in college, so it would be much better if we had peace. But peace is not the ultimate value. Ask FDR, ask Churchill. If FDR and Churchill had said that peace was the ultimate value, we'd be living in under the Nazis. Everybody in this room practically would be dead, and America would be a place that nobody in their right mind would want to be alive. Peace is unbelievably important, but more important is truth, more important is justice, more important is morality, more important is what is right. Now, why do I point that out tonight? As you know, um, Israel is soon, my little neighborhood, south of the south southern part of Jerusalem called Baca, is soon going to be in lockdown and gridlock that you can't begin to imagine. And that is because your president is coming to my town. And that means that for days on end, we are not going to be able to move anywhere, even from the kitchen to the living room, without Secret Service looking up our noses and everywhere else trying to make sure that nobody hurts him. He's going to come to Israel unless Israel doesn't have a coalition. I think he's going to come to Israel. And if it were up to me, and I was working in Washington, D.C., and I was the head of some organization that wanted to make peace in the Middle East come faster, and I could get the ear of the president, here's what I would tell him to say. I would actually ask him to get up after he shakes all the people's hands and visits a mosque and visits a synagogue and visits a museum and goes to an Arab school and goes to a Jewish school and puts a little petek inside the kotel and goes and looks at all the remnants of the Qassam since they would have to do all the things that every tourist, important and non-important, has to do. Here's what I would actually want him to say to the cameras. I would want him to speak, not to the Israeli people, but I would want him to speak to the Palestinian people. And here's what I would want him to say. I want him to say that what's made America great is America's values. I would want him to say, Palestinians, here's the thing. When I look out at this region, and I remember the values back home that have made America great, and I see two different societies, I see one society that embodies those values, and one society that does not embody those values. America believes in democracy. Israel has, as everybody knows, a pretty robust democracy. You don't. You elect Mahmoud Abbas, but there's no real significant opposition. Everybody knows it. Stop pretending. America would like to see you have a real democracy because Israelis know what happens when you give up lots of land to a non-democracy. You get Egypt today. You get Morsi. You don't have the Sinai, but you don't have a deal that you can bet anything on anymore. Israelis are nervous. So to make Israelis less nervous and to make your own lives better, why don't you actually try out democracy? A lot of the world thinks it's a pretty good thing. Women. Women make up approximately half of the world. The Bible says that they belong here. The Quran says that they belong here. Why don't you start treating them the way we in America treat them? Why don't you, for example, stop executing your adult daughters who have sex out of marriage? Literally happens all over the place in the West Bank, and my book is for sale later tonight, and it's got all the data, the numbers, and all of that. We think it's wrong. We think it's horrendous. We think it's abominable. We think it's infinitely worse than misogynist. We know that the way women are treated in Israel, we know the way women are treated in the Palestinian areas, whatever you want to call them. Stop it. Grow up. Join the 21st century. To be what Israel is. Religious minorities. It's not perfect to be a Muslim in Israel. It's not always ideal to be a Christian in Israel. But it's a hell of a lot better to be a Christian in Israel than it is to be a Christian in Gaza or to be a Christian on the West Bank. And it's infinitely better than being, of course, a Jew in any one of those places because you couldn't actually survive. We think that the religious rights of minorities matter. We want you to be like America. We want you to be like Israel. Freedom of the press. You should stop jailing people because they put a picture of Mahmoud Abbas on Facebook and make some snarky comment. You go to jail in the West Bank for that. You literally go to jail. We think that's ridiculous and it's reprehensible. Israel has a sickeningly robust and free press. We want you to be that sickening. Freedom of association. 600,000 people get together every summer in Israel to protest this and protest that. Palestinians don't allow it. What's made America great is you can get together, you can protest, you can do what you want. We'd like to see the Palestinian street look like Tel Aviv. We'd like to see it look like New York. We'd like to see it look like a lot of different places all across America. We would also like to say, Palestinians, that 70 years after the end of the Second World War, the mere idea that you would basically say in public that you are going to create a state without Jews should send shivers up the spine of every sentient being who lives on the planet. But that's what you basically said. 
you say Israelis, but there are no other Jews who want to move to Palestine. What kind of Jew from the Bay Area says, I, live, I dream of going to Ramallah and living there? There's a great new condo complex. Let's be serious. Who are we talking about? We are talking about Israelis who have, for a variety of reasons, some economic, some religious, some political, some ideological, chosen to live on that side of the line. And let's say some of them want to stay. They believe that Shiloh or Eli are really important places in the Bible, and it's meaningful for them to live there. And they've buried their parents there. And God forbid they've buried their children there. They don't want to leave. They give up their guns, they'll this, they'll pay taxes, spouse and authority. Why can't they stay? Aren't you ashamed that you would be the only country anywhere on the planet, that, Saudi Arabia is like this, they just don't say it, that would openly admit that it won't allow Jews in its borders? We think you should change on that too. We could go on and on. But what I would say fundamentally is that if Barack Obama got up and said that, and said to them, listen, when you decide to climb out of the Middle Ages, when you decide to join modernity in the 21st century, when you decide to actually embody all of the values that make America great, and quite frankly, the values that make Israel great, and quite frankly, the kind of values which if your citizens had them, they would never want to go to war because they'd be too busy living good lives, building businesses, and so forth, America would be entirely behind you. If Barack Obama did that, he would actually move peace forward. If you said to Barack Obama to say that, you would actually move peace forward. I want to conclude relatively quickly. Relatively quickly. There is a, um, there's a dynamic in the international community now, which is the problem is that, that Mahmoud Abbas is not an idiot. He's a smart guy. He's not a great Zionist. He's not a lifetime member of Hadassah or anything of the sort. But he's not an idiot. And he looks at the evidence out there and he understands the time is on his side. So he has no need to make a deal. Fifteen years ago, you would not have imagined that the day would come that there would be no more discussion of whether or not the Palestinians are a people. I'm not taking a stand, they are, they aren't. But you would not have imagined fifteen years ago... Would simply disappear. Ten years ago, you would not have imagined that there would be a situation in which even Likuma prime ministers get up at Bar Ilan University and endorse a two-state solution. Unimaginable ten years ago. But it happened. Five years ago, you would not have imagined that the United Nations would vote to actually give the Palestinians observer status by a vote of 138 to 9. When the mandate was voted on in 1947, it was 33 to 13 to 1. And since you needed two-thirds, that was a squeaker. This was not a squeaker. And the United States and Canada and Israel were joined by the Czech Republic and Micronesia and Nauru. I didn't even know that was a country. Israel is unbelievably marginalized. And if only Mahmoud Abbas understood the time was not on his side, he might actually come to the deal. But he'd be crazy to make a deal. He would be crazy. And if I was his advisor, I would say, don't come to the table. Your position is stronger than it was five years ago. And then it was stronger than it was five years before that. Your position is getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. If you make a deal now, you'll regret it because there's going to be a deal that's better for you down the road because the world is turning on Israel. My question is, why join the people who are turning on Israel? And why not join the people who actually want to hold the Palestinians accountable to a kind of a way of life, modernity-wise, morality-wise, and so forth, that I think we could all be much more proud of? Norway is probably the most liberal country in the galaxy. It is certainly one of the most supportive countries anywhere in Europe of the Palestinians. And there was an article in the Miami Herald, which just came out on Thursday, which reported that Norway Norwegians are actually rethinking their commitment to aid to the Palestinians. And here is the Miami Herald's summary of what the Norwegian politician said. The PA, which governs the West Bank, is the only current alternative to Hamas, the militant Islamic organization that rules Hamas and re rejects Israel's existence. The PA should be supported and strengthened, but only if it will reject the, ide the ideology of hatred. Any other response from donors, as Norway is discovering, amounts to sending money to fight against peace. Here's my question. The Miami Herald gets it. Norway gets it. Why don't you guys get it? There is no reason that American Jews can't critique Israel, but there are different kinds of critique. There is critique that is wrapped in layers of love, and there is critique that drips with venom. Everybody can tell the difference. Thanks. Um, 
to introduce our next speaker. It's my great pleasure to introduce another great, great pillar of our community and a founder of Qualcomm, uh, Dr. Erwin Jacobs. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Good to see you, everyone here. What sounds like it's going to be a rather interesting uh, discussion. I won't read a bio uh, of Jeremy. I think there's one in your booklet. And I would recommend everybody getting a copy of the book. Uh, it's both a bit about Jeremy, but a lot about the foundations of Israel, a lot of things that happened leading up to the partitioning and the war that came thereafter, I think was very, very interesting. I also have your, your book as well, so. <laughs> It's, it's been very interesting <laughs> going through. First met uh, Jeremy uh, just about a year ago over at the La Jolla Country Club, which is interesting because a few years earlier probably would not have been possible to have Jews visiting there. Luckily, things have changed. And uh, I was very much taken by his discussion of the need to work toward a two-party, a two-state solution, that without that, we're all going to be in trouble forever going forward, that there are steps that can be taken now, rather than simply waiting or trying to reform the other side completely, steps to be taken now that would make a lot of sense. I found that very meaningful to me, and um, I have become much more interested in following a lot of what's been happening. I also think it's important for all of us to keep track of what is happening in Israel. I think, although it's obviously more critical to people who live there than it is to us, uh, as far as the exact steps that are being taken, that there are a lot of very interesting work. I just came back with Joan from a meeting of the uh, Israel Democratic Institute, looking at issues of the Constitution, of Bill of Rights, of how do you have a Jewish state and a democracy, all very difficult issues, ones I think of great interest to us as well as clearly to Israelis. So let me uh, welcome Jeremy, and I hope he can in fact give us a reason that peace is possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Erwin. Uh, thank you very, very much to Congregation Bethel. Thank you, Rabbi Graubert. I also want to just uh, acknowledge that in the audience we have a number of uh, San Diego J Street uh, activists. We have a very wonderful chapter here, and I just want to say thank you to, uh, to all of them, to our J Street U students from the university, uh, and also finally to Mayor Bob Filner, uh, who is here who's a good friend uh, personally and a very good friend of uh, J Street. I, I really deeply welcome the chance that this evening provides to engage in a constructive and civil conversation. Uh, too often in our community, uh, people who have divergent opinions retreat to their own corners, kind of the Fox and MSNBC uh, approach to Jewish communal conversation. And, and perhaps tonight can be a bit of the CNN, where we bring together uh, some of our uh, conflicting views, asking tough questions, in engaging in discussion, debating difficult issues, these are an integral part of our heritage as Jews, and they're part of what makes it such a wonderful thing to be a part of the Jewish people. And there aren't many issues as challenging today for Jews worldwide as, as talking about and trying to work our way through uh, a path to the security, prosperity, uh, well-being, and, and democratic and Jewish character of the State of Israel. I expect uh, that as the evening unfolds that, that Daniel and I will find some common ground. Uh, I was hopeful prior to your introduction that we'd find more. I'm afraid that there's probably a, a little less uh, than I thought, uh, and, I, and I'm sure that there will be plenty of us uh, uh, to have that civil disagreement over. Um, but I just would like to stipulate, and I hope we can agree to this up front, that, uh, um, you know, just the, the use of the word venom uh, I hope we can stipulate up front that we both come to this conversation with 
a deep love uh, of, of and wanting for the best for the state of Israel. Uh, my own love of Israel is rooted in my own family history. Uh, my great-grandparents were in the first wave of the first Aliyah. One pair established with their children and 17 other families, a Jewish town called Pirach Tikva. Another pair went to the old city of Jerusalem in the 1880s. Uh, both of my great-grandfathers gave their lives in that first decade to uh, disease and to accident, but their children multiplied and they prospered. And my grandparents were among the 60 families who helped to found Tel Aviv. And my father was born there 100 years ago. He went on to be a freedom fighter for Israel in the 1930s and 1940s. He was a commander in the Irgun, a good liberal organization, <laughs> under the uh, leadership of Menachem Begin. My father was involved in efforts to help smuggle Jews out of Europe before World War II, and he came to the States to help raise money for rescue and to, to buy arms for the fight for independence in the years leading up to 1948. He was aboard the infamous boat, the Altalena, in 1948, when David Ben-Gurion ordered the boat destroyed. And that was the moment when my father decided that he couldn't live in the Israel that he had worked so hard and fought so hard to create. So I was born in New York. Uh, and my house and my life were filled with Israel. We spent a great deal of time there during my childhood. I ultimately lived uh, in Israel. We actually moved there around the same time. I did not end up staying and making Aliyah. I stayed for three years in the late 1990s. Uh, and today my family numbers about 500 cousins all over the country and all over the political spectrum. So I hope it is clear that while I do not live in Israel today, I am as deeply connected to it as it is possible to be, and I am proud to devote my life today to working through J Street to safeguard Israel's future, its security, and its character. In fact, it is J Street's mission to fight for Israel's survival and its security by promoting American leadership to achieve a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And we do this precisely because we love Israel so deeply. And we believe that the lack of a resolution to this conflict poses not only an existential challenge for Israel and for its security, but a fundamental challenge to its Jewish and its democratic character as well. So let me put out two things that I hope that Daniel and I can, can agree on. The first is that peace will never be and cannot be imposed on Israel by an outside party, not by the United States, not by the Quartet, not by the EU, not by the UN. Israel is a vibrant and robust democracy. And no peace deal can gain acceptance if the majority of Israel voters and its citizens don't buy into it. Second, I hope that we can also stipulate that whatever criticisms we may have about Israeli governments, past or present, that the Palestinians should, in fact, shoulder a great deal of the blame for the past failures uh, in peace negotiations. And Daniel has, has articulated a litany of those failures. The Palestinians in the broader Arab world have made serious mistakes and they continue to make them. When Palestinians name squares or institutions after suicide bombers, when they fail to acknowledge Jewish history and attachment to the land of Israel, when they resort to terror and violence against innocent civilians to advance their political cause, then we should condemn such behaviors and demand better. I also hope that Daniel and I can agree that as Prime Minister Sharon once stated, and I quote, Israel is not simply an Israeli project. Israel is a Jewish worldwide project. Israelis and Americans need each other. We need Israel because a strong and flourishing Israel will strengthen and inspire Jews all over the world and help to ensure the survival of the Jewish people and of Judaism itself. But Israel also needs us. It needs our support, both emotional and political. It needs its alliance with the United States, which we, as American Jews, do so much to enhance and preserve. It needs our intellectual vibrancy as well. And it needs our love, and it needs our opinions. We, as American Jews, have a vital role to play, both as Americans and as Jews. As Americans, we are deeply involved in and invested in the foreign policy of our nation. 
We, as American Jews, work for a strong America and all that it represents in the world. And we recognize that Israeli-Palestinian peace is a crucial American strategic interest that could help bring some much-needed stability to a volatile region that affects our own interests in the region and around the world. Of course, I am deeply aware, only too aware, that we living in the United States do not bear the same risks and burdens as our brothers and our sisters who live in Israel. We don't have to worry about bombs on buses or in cafes or rockets falling on our heads from the skies. We do not, as Daniel does, send our children to serve and to fight. Neither do we give up years of our own lives to military service, nor do we pay at least Israeli taxes for part of that defense burden. And so we do recognize that Israel's citizens bear the responsibility for the decisions about their country's policy and direction. I often say that the Jews who live in Israel own the voting shares in running the enterprise that is the national homeland of our people. However, I do believe that as conscientious Jews living elsewhere but committed to Israel's future, that we too have stock in this enterprise. We should have a voice, if not a full vote. As members of the Jewish people, we have a right and an obligation to be honest with our family and friends who live in Israel about the circumstances in which the country now finds itself. As friends and families, we offer that perspective and our advice out of love. And incidentally, Jews tend to agree that we have that right. A poll last June by the Anti-Defamation League found that 61% of Israelis believe that American Jews have the right to freely and publicly criticize Israel and Israeli policies. So I expect this to be one of the major topics of our discussion tonight. What are the boundaries for discussion and for advocacy around Israel for Jews who do not live there? And I've heard you say before, Daniel, that when Israel is troubled and in pain, its friends and its family owe it unvarnished loyalty. Well, I beg, beg to differ. I think that when a brother or a sister is in trouble, you owe them the truth. And the truth may be painful, but when lives are at stake, intervention, not enabling silence, may be the truest act of friendship. So this brings me to my final point. If we are truly concerned as friends and out of love about Israel's future as a democracy and as a Jewish state, we must do everything in our power to bring about a two-state solution because this is the only way to preserve the Israel that we love. And I do think that Daniel and I agree on this. He and I both know there is no other viable solution. The Palestinians are not going away and neither are the Jewish people. So unless we want a fight to the death, we must find a way to divide the land so that both peoples can fulfill their national aspirations. As I understand it, Daniel agrees with the premise but believes there's nothing that can be done because the Palestinians haven't shown that they want peace and a two-state solution. Well, Daniel, I have to say that I think that, the, that those who say they are for a two-state solution but that there's nothing that can be done are a lot like an overweight chain smoker who sits on his couch saying that one day he'll run the marathon. I'll argue tonight that it is not enough to say that you want a two-state solution, but the fault is all the other guys. I would ask you, what are you willing to do now to demonstrate that you are serious about a two-state solution? I would ask the new Israeli government that I hope will be formed in the next 24 hours, what will it be willing to do? Because if all we're going to see over the coming few years is another 50,000 Jewish residents over the Green Line, more and more ongoing and building settler violence, and a deepening physical divide between Palestinian East Jerusalem and the rest of the West Bank, then the chances of Israel surviving as a Jewish and a democratic nation are as good as the chain smokers of running the marathon. Time is running out. There are now over 600,000 Jewish Israelis living across the Green Line on land captured in 1967. And the window of opportunity for establishing a viable, contiguous Palestinian state is shutting. The Palestinian people between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River will soon outnumber the Jewish people. 
and they will simply start to demand the right to vote and their equal civil rights. And in that struggle, they will command the support of nearly the entire international community, as we just saw at the United Nations, not because of anti-Semitism, and believe me, I know that there's plenty of that in the region and in the world, and not because of a desire to delegitimize the right of the Jewish people to a state of their own, but because in the 21st century, it simply will not fly for one people to hold dominion over another without granting them their rights. The future that Israel is heading towards, some call it the one-state solution. I call it the one-state nightmare. Failure to divide into two states will guarantee the Jewish and the Palestinian people a nightmarish future of endless bloodshed, endless strife, generation after generation of victims on both sides. Is that the future that we want for our children and grandchildren? I really hope that this can be the focus, the second main focus of our discussion tonight, Daniel. If you do not believe that there is anything that Israel can do to advance a two-state solution, then please tell me what you propose to do. And I'm sorry, just criticizing the Palestinians and assessing blame for past failures doesn't cut it. It's intellectually dishonest, and focusing on the past, not the future, does us all a disservice. Let me say one more thing in closing, which is that I would love to hear Daniel make it crystal clear that he does not see as a solution to this dilemma the mass deportation of the Palestinian people from Israel. In his book, Saving Israel, Daniel outlines three possible solutions to the demographic challenge which threatens its future as the national home of the Jewish people. The fact that there will soon be more Palestinians than Jews in the land between the Jordan and the Mediterranean. The first is the mass aliyah of Jews from the United States or France, but we all know that that's not going to happen on a large enough scale to alter the demographics. The second is moving the border to exclude some Arab populated parts of Israel. But for that to work, you'd actually have to have a Palestinian state. So finally, Daniel discusses the possibility of deporting millions of Palestinians and also Arab citizens of the state of Israel to other countries. And he implies that it could actually be done in an orderly and peaceful fashion because it's been done elsewhere. Really? Let me state clearly that the idea of mass deportation of people from their land is morally repugnant. It goes against Jewish ethics, and it would be rightly seen by the international community as a crime against humanity. I believe that just by raising this unacceptable idea as a matter for legitimate discussion, we've done ourselves a grave disservice. So in the course of tonight's discussion, I hope to hear you, Daniel, disavow this particular idea. In fact, I hope that'll be a good place for us to begin to find some common ground and some movement. Thank you again, Rabbi Grauber. Thank you, Congregation Bethel, for this invitation. I look forward to what I assume will be a lively discussion. Thank you. So thank you for this part, um, Daniel and Jeremy are going to just talk back and forth and respond to what they each said. And um, they're each going to take two, three minutes to respond. Uh, and uh, I'm actually going to, I'm going to grab my watch and I'll, <laughs> this time I'll make sure. And thank you. And so Daniel's going to go first and respond to what Jeremy said and then, um, and then Jeremy will respond and we'll see, we'll do that uh, maybe two times, maybe three times. Okay, Daniel. Okay, I'm going to put Jeremy out of his misery, and I will say unequivocally that I am not in favor of the mass deportation of Arabs out of the West Bank. I will also say unequivocally that my book does not suggest that I am in favor of it. I use the analogy of Cyprus, where actually the movement of populations did bring a war to an end. And I mentioned it. It's been taken out of context by a whole series of illustrious people. You join them in a very, um, in a very noble way. Uh, I only hope that the book that you quoted out of context you at least paid for, but in any event, for the purpose of tonight, I will say I do not, uh, I am not in favor of moving lots of Palestinians or Arabs any place. I also do not believe that all American Jews should make Aliyah. My davening three times a day includes a long list of American Jews I pray will never make Aliyah. 
it is not it is not working. Um, you're getting close, but um, but uh, but it is not working. But anyway, so yes, you can relax. We should not talk about mass deportation. Okay, good. Okay, great. Now read the rest of the chapter. All right, now uh, a couple of things. We we agree we agree about everything till minute fifteen thirty. Uh, then we sort of hit some turbulence. So let me just say very very quickly. Um, it's not true that there's no other viable solution. It's just not true. Everybody knows Egypt fell, Syria is going to fall, and you think Jordan is then going to just sit pretty? Abdallah is going to fall. Mark my words. And when the Hashemite minority falls to a Palestinian majority, why in the world should nobody possibly consider doing what the case used to be? Having the West Bank be part of that. Am I saying that that's easy to do? Am I saying it's an ideal solution? There are no ideal solutions. We would both agree with that. But I just, as a matter of fact, it's just simply not the case that there is no other viable solution. I do favor a two-state solution, but it's not the only viable solution. That's point number one. Point number two. As soon as you say time is running out, you set yourself up to make very, very bad mistakes. If I say I want to buy a certain business, but my God, I got to close the deal by Friday, I'm going to make a goof. If I say to myself, I'd like to buy the business, but it might take six months to close the deal, it might take a year to close the deal, I might have to actually stop the negotiations and come back next year, then I probably will do it a lot more smartly. Time is not running out. Time is of the essence, but time is not running out. Israelis showed very clearly in 2005, when we want to get out of a certain spot, we know how to bulldoze our houses, we know how to bulldoze all sorts of streets, we unbury, we disinter the children that we buried in Gaza and move them back inside the line. We can give it over to the Palestinians. I'm not advocating it. It was a very painful thing to do. But we show that there's never a point at which you can say time is running out. Therefore, what we need to do is not feel the pressure to our heads because we're going to make mistakes. We will and they will. We got to do this slowly, carefully, methodically. And I agree with you. We do want to try to move to that as well. Now, you threw in at the same exact thing, people living over the Green Line and settler violence. It was part of the same, you didn't take a breath between them. But that's not fair, because settler violence is a disgusting violation of Israeli law that, quite frankly, the Netanyahu government has been far too lax and far too prepared to countenance. And if the people that I hope are now going to run the government get into power, I think that that will hopefully come to a stop. But I would not in the same breath say settler violence and people moving across the Green Line. I want to remind everybody what that Green Line is. That Green Line is the 1949 armistice line that the Arabs refused to recognize as a border. Why do you get to say in 1949 the line means absolutely nothing, but in 2013 it's as holy as the holy of holies and anybody that moves across it, etc. By the way, Ashkelon and Ashdod are also over the line. They're over the only line that the international community ever voted on, which was on November 29th, 1947. So if you want to, why is one line more holy than the other line? I think that you and I should agree that settler violence is a morally reprehensible phenomenon that should embarrass Israel and should be stopped. But settlers, or you call them settlers, I call them residents of the West Bank, but it doesn't make any difference. Those people have moved there not to put their thumb in the eyes of Arabs or anything of the sort. They've moved there in large measure because it's much cheaper housing. Some of them move there for ideological reasons, the same way that people move to Eilat and Beersheba and Ashdod and Ashkelon and Jerusalem, all places that needed Jews to live in them so that they could become sustainable. I actually give those people a lot of credit. So we have to be able to say, why is moving across a line that was created in 49 and then nullified in 67, a horrible thing to do, but a line that was created in 47 and nullified in 49, a not horrible thing to do. Do these lines matter? Do they not matter? We actually agree about the vast majority of things. And what, the last question that I'll simply say in the two minutes that I've probably turned into more, and I apologize for that, is what can Israel do? I think that, look, the, the, current, elections, the current elections are a very important thing. And they should fill you with tremendous pride and tremendous optimism and perhaps a little bit of a conversation with the cheering crowd over there. Um, maybe it's time to go out of business because, frankly, Israelis just did what we wanted to try to pressure them to do. So what exactly are we doing? What Israelis just did is they said, let's go back to the table. You ought to hope, God forbid, that Sipi Livni does not become the one to actually run this because everything that she runs seems to hit a wall. But no, 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 she's just not a very effective politician. But somebody ought to do it. I think it should be somebody serious. And let's see if we can get to a deal. Israel should do the following. It should conduct itself in the territories that it has now in as morally po uh, uh, upright way as it possibly can. It should try to let the Arabs who live there live lives of dignity and security without us being all over them. It should make it clear to the Arabs and the international community that whenever 
they are willing to make a serious deal. We are willing to come to the table anywhere at any time. But until the point that they acknowledge that the Jews have a right to a Jewish state in the Middle East, and until the point that... And until the point that they acknowledge that those refugees who have suffered, but they're not going back, until they recognize those two non-negotiable things, Israel has to say to the world, we are here, we are waiting, they know where to find us. When they want to join a real negotiation, we're going to have peace. True, well, I will be brief. Uh, you know, I'm glad to see that we've already moved on a couple of things and we're, we're making progress at uh, coming together on this. I'll, I would also, uh, uh, you know, acknowledge very, very clearly that uh, I do not by any means mean to, to tar all of the people who live across the green line with the odious tag of settler violence. I mean, it is uh, obviously very, very different for those families who have moved for economic reasons or have been encouraged by the government uh, to, to move their families to a suburb of Jerusalem uh, than it is for those who are living on the hilltops uh, and engaging in the burning of olive trees and attacking of Palestinian families. So those are obviously and mosques. Right. And so it is two very different things. So again, I will acknowledge that and, and, and I don't mean to, to tar them with the same brush. Uh, what I would say is that the issues of right of return, the issue of the Jewish connection uh, to the land of Israel and the state of the Jewish people, uh, similarly, the, ultimately, the, the settlement of the claims of the refugees from, from 48, those are issues that aren't going to be settled before a negotiation begins. Those are, if you're saying that Israel isn't going to begin to, to get into a process or begin the process of diplomacy until there's an acknowledgement that refugees won't return and that, that Israel is a, is a Jewish state in some manner, I, I think you're automatically ruling out the possibility of ever beginning uh, negotiations because those kinds of preconditions uh, are the end of negotiations, not the beginning. And so I think those are very, very important topics. And obviously, J Street has a very clear position on the non-return uh, of refugees and that that obviously would kill the notion of a state of the Jewish people. And we obviously have a very clear position that Israel is, in fact, the national home of the Jewish people. But those are the things that are going to have to be worked out at the end of a process, not at the beginning. So the question is, if those are going to be barriers and therefore nothing is going to happen on the diplomatic front, what happens to Israel over the course of the next decade or two? That, that continues to be the question that I think should plague all of us. Because if there isn't progress, if there isn't any benefit from the diplomatic uh, process, then those who are on the Palestinian side still willing to talk about two states and still willing to strike a deal, it will be, in fact, proven correct to the Palestinian people that they were the naive ones, to believe that there was someone to talk to, that there was hope in nonviolence, that there was hope in diplomacy, if Mahmoud Abbas, if Salam Fayyad, if the present leadership of the Palestinian Authority at the end of the day cannot deliver, the only beneficiary is Hamas. The only beneficiary in the war between the moderates and the extremists on the Palestinian side, if we don't work with the moderates and try to bolster them and help them to deliver results to their people will be a leadership far worse than we have today. And we will rue the day that we missed this opportunity, and possibly it is a last opportunity, to actually achieve that two-state solution. Because I think once that train leaves the station, and once we move to the point where we have a Hamas leadership or worse that covers the entirety of the Palestinian people, there really will be no going back. Uh, and that leads to an e e eternal civil war uh, that I know that you don't want your kids to be involved in, I don't want my family to be involved in, none of us want to see. So I think the, the onus is on us not to point to what the other side needs to do, not to point to reasons why you know, we don't really want to talk to them, but to say what are we willing to do now in order to make that possible. So before... Okay. Uh, before we get to questions, I think we'll do one more go-round to the two of you. And before we get to that, uh, I forgot to welcome the 200-plus people that are watching online. We, we are live streaming this. So thank you very much for watching over there. <laughs> I'm just looking at the camera. And um, uh, 
our first live stream event. Welcome. All right. Um, so, Daniel. The question is, are we trending on Twitter? That's the biggest I'm issue. sure that we're not. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> but okay. maybe you could actually do something about that right now. Your crowd could actually make us trend on Twitter. What the hell are they doing out there? Okay. Um, but there's a lot of issues. We actually agree on a lot more than we disagree about, I actually think, tonight. Um, but I want to point to one issue that you raised, which is uh, we neither of us have touched on it. But there's, there's an assumption that you make, which is either right or wrong, which is that the Palestinians are somehow involved in a national issue, not a religious issue. Let's just look at this in two possible ways. One, you're right. One, you're wrong. If you're wrong, uh, which is very possible, it means the following. Look, Yemen has fallen to Islamic fundamentalists. Morocco has fallen to Islamic fundamentalists. Turkey is no longer the secular Turkey that it was. Um, now let's look about right around the corner. Egypt, gone to the Muslim Brotherhood. Gaza, in the hands of Hamas. Lebanon, completely run by Hezbollah. Bashar al-Assad in Syria, you can probably count the days. And here's a case, by the way, where our humanity and our Zionism are actually in conflict with each other. He's a horrifying butcher, so you want him to fall. And you also know that the people that follow him are going to be infinitely worse for Israel. It's one of those things that should literally keep you up at night in inordinate pain, because it's a horrible situation. Go down to Saudi Arabia, it is not, the last time I checked, one of the great liberal democracies of the Western world. Which leaves Jordan, which I think, you know, you would not want to double or money your life savings on King Abdullah being in power in two years, which means the following very serious question. The Palestinians are the only ones not swept away by this wave of Muslim fundamentalism? Is that really possible? Now, I guess it's possible, but it seems to me to be very unlikely. We're having a conversation as if the Palestinians are just like the Israelis. They've got a set of political, ideological, territorial concerns, and reasonable minds can actually reach, a reach some sort of consensus. But I don't know the answer to this question. I don't think anybody knows the answer to this question. But if the Palestinians have actually been caught up in the ideological fervor of the transition of the Middle East to a place of radical Islam, there is no negotiating with them. There is no negotiating with Morsi, there's no negotiating with Hamas, there's no negotiating with Hezbollah, there is going to be no negotiating with the people who take over from Bashar al-Assad in Syria. If that has already happened, then it is too late. And the train is out of the station, and it's not Israel's fault. And if Israel had given up the West Bank prior, it would simply be facing radical Muslim terrorism from literally a kilometer from my house, as opposed to a handful of kilometers from my house. I don't think we know the answer to that question, but there is a very real possibility that people who espouse your position never seem to really talk about that it's actually already too late because Muslim fundamentalism has taken this over. I don't have proof that it hasn't, but you don't have proof, I don't have proof that it has, but you don't have proof that it hasn't. I know you should both acknowledge it's one of the great unknowns. If it in fact is uh, not taken over, it's one of the great miracles of all time. Um, and it's also, I think, um, it's also, uh, I, th I think something that, if, if it is not yet taken over by, by radical Islam, then there is still time to work. And then I would say, you're right, we have to move quickly. But again, I would say we have to move deliberately at the same time. The last thing that I want to just say in this last two-minute thing, which I'm, neither of us are holding the two minutes, so we're both Jewish, is um, I think we should be very honest about something. Israel is 65 years old. I think it's a very open question as to whether Israel is going to be here in 65 years. It is by no means a foregone conclusion. And it has very little to do with just this issue. And it has a lot to do with this issue. But this issue is not the main issue. The main issue is Iran. And Iran can destroy Israel without ever using the bomb. They just have to have it. All they have to do is have the bomb. And then they, the next time Israel sends 60,000 kids to the Gazan border because they wrote and Ashkelon and Ashdod and Tel Aviv and Beersheba are all being hit. And the soldiers amass and the equipment and the armor is pulled over and etc. etc. And then Iran says, no, 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 no. The first minute that a single Israeli foot crosses the line, we're going to nuke you. Now, maybe they will and maybe they won't. But if you're Bibi Netanyahu or whoever replaces him eventually, are you going to take that chance? So the likelihood is you don't take that chance. And you tell the boys to go home. And then the people in Sterot say, what about me? The first thing that my government owes me is safety. That's the first thing that your government owes you. The reason you put up with the obscenity called American airports is because you know that as insane as it is, your government's just trying to protect you. So take off your shoes, 
Take off your laptop. Take out your laptop. I'm serious about this. Take out your laptop. Let them take a picture of you naked and wire it to somebody who is allegedly thousands of miles away, but is probably right around the corner. And really, who cares? But you go through this indignity because you know that your government has a responsibility to defend you. If Israel cannot defend its citizens, which it will not be able to do as long as Iran can simply threaten the use of a weapon, its most mobile, most educated, most whatever citizens will leave. All of them? No. Lots of them? Yes. And what you will find is a country with an economy that dives, with an educational system that knows dives, and you'll find in a country that in the long run is not sustainable, all of which is saying, we need to conduct ourselves recognizing that as important as this issue is, it is not the only issue that matters for Israel. And we are talking about a country that may or may not make it in another 65 years. And by the way, do not delude yourselves into thinking that if Israel doesn't make it, make it that San Diego Jewry looks anything like it does half a generation after that. Not nearly remotely. So therefore, I ask, why are you guys so insistent on pressuring the United States not to impose the sanctions on Iran that might be the last stopgap measure to ultimately save the Jewish state. So just on that last note, I just want to say, sorry, it's hard to speak if you're uh, shouting. Um, I just want to make it very clear to the audience, make it clear to Daniel, make sure we understand each other, that J Street supports sanctions on Iran. We have supported every sanctions bill on Iran. We continue to support sanctions on Iran. So if there was an implication there that we don't, I just want to clarify that. Um, I'll also say I, I agree that one of the scariest things about the shifting dynamics of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the move away from it being a nationalist struggle into being a religious struggle. I do believe that nationalist struggles can be solved. I don't know that religious conflicts can be solved. And I worry both about those on our uh, side uh, who, who believe that God gave them everything and therefore they can't compromise. And I worry about those on the other side who feel that way. And then it's uh, very scary because I think nationalist movements uh, recognize that the end goal is to have a safe, secure home for them and their families and their kids and the, their grandkids and they're willing to, to, to compromise in the end. And I'm afraid that religious fanatics in the end won't. And so I share that concern. Uh, I also share the concern that 65 years from now Israel won't be there. But I, I worry about it in a different way. I, I worry that the reasoning, the line of reasoning that you have is a line of reasoning that says don't do anything. I, you know, I, I, I think that the risks and the dangers of trying, of stopping settlements, of eliminating all preconditions, of saying that there'll be a state based on the 67 borders with swaps, which is what the president has asked for, those risks are worth taking because if we don't take those risks and if we don't go down this path, this occupation is going to continue without end and it will not only result in, as I said before, you know, a majority of non-Jews living in this land controlled by a minority of Jews, and you know the moral problems that come with that, or it becomes a democratic one state in which the majority will vote for its own government and there will no longer be a, a national home of the Jewish people. And therefore, that is an irreversible existential threat. And not acting, and, and you may not want to talk about time running out and it not being on our side, but sadly, it isn't on our side, and the clock is running against us, and, the, and, the, and it is on the Palestinian side. I'll agree with you on that. But I, I worry that that is not a reason to do nothing. That's actually a reason to take some risks, and it is a reason to actually try, because if we don't, we'll be stuck with this occupation, we'll be stuck with a minority ruling over a majority, it will erode our character as the Jewish people, it will erode our position in the world, Israel will become even more of a pariah than it is today, and we will lose over the course of the next 65 years the very thing that you and I do care so deeply about. Uh, so we'll go to take some questions now from, the, uh, from our, our audience. So this is for Dr. Gordas. The traditional form of supporting Israel for diaspora Jews has been to stand with Israel unconditionally 
supporting whatever policies the democratically elected government implements. Is this approach still relevant? No, I think that one of the things that I wouldn't say ails the international Jewish community, but challenges the international Jewish community, is that we're still searching for a paradigm. And one of the painful things for any people, any organization, any family, any relationship, is recognizing that an old paradigm has fractured without having quite figured out what the new paradigm is. That can happen in a marriage, it can happen with children, it can happen in a whole array of different ways, and it's very painful and it's very unsettling. The old notion of we send our children to the army so you send us your money and shut up, um, that was in fact what a lot of Israeli leaders said I think in the 50s and the 60s and so on and so forth. Everybody understands that that's ridiculous. And I think that it should be clear that uh, what we disagree about, and you, you made a lot of a, a big, a big uh, point of making this in, in your opening remarks, uh, what we disagree about are some of the issues about risk taking and how fast to move, not at all about whether you ought to have a voice. I mean, I think that there's no way to interpret anything I've ever said or written to, an, it, nobody could, even with the, um, with the hermeneutic that you used on my book chapter there, uh, there's no way to read, to, to, to make it clear, to suggest that I've suggested that American Jews don't have something to say that's very, very important. So the old paradigm is broken. The question is, what's the new paradigm? And I think that something like tonight is actually the new paradigm, recognizing that at the end of the day, the risks are not equal. Let's just be honest. The risks are not equal. By the same token, um, we are, is the Jewish state is the state of the Jewish people, not the state of Israeli citizens. And that means that Israelis have to recognize that if we want people to be loyal to us and supportive of us, and I never ever said that people should give us unvarnished loyalty, because I never used the word unvarnished in my life. Um, but if, I, if we want people to feel part of this, we have to allow for there to be serious dialogue, and I think that tonight is actually a perfect example of that. We are not going to convince each other about everything, obviously, but I think what we are demonstrating is that people from different perspectives can actually sit and have a very civil conversation, um, and that young people cheer for him more than they cheer for me, and I'll, you know, where I'm staying tonight, I'm sure there's good scotch, and I'll deal with it, but at the end of the day, um, you know, but that, I think what we are actually demonstrating is that we are searching together for a new paradigm. The old paradigm is broken. We don't know what the new one is exactly, but I think that we're actually in the dark groping to find something very important. Uh, so, Jeremy, this is a similar question to the flip side of it. Does having two Israel lobbies in the U.S. government give divergent messages, confuse elected officials, and potentially harm the state of Israel and the Jewish community at large? Sadly, we are a people of more than two opinions. <laughs> and I think that it is a disservice to our community to portray to elected officials that we are a single unified body that only has one opinion on an issue that is unbelievably difficult and complex. Uh, there are certain issues that I think are relatively wall to wall. There, there's a small part of the Jewish community that doesn't favor continuing aid to Israel. And we should acknowledge that. And then, look, it's a democratic society. They have a right to say that. But that's a really, really minority view in the American Jewish community. And so you know, J Street and APAC and ZOA and the American Jewish Committee and all the rest of the groups will, will go to the Hill and say, we support aid to Israel. But when it comes to some of the issues of should the president, for instance, put out parameters of a peace deal and say to the sides, Let's get beyond some of the tiffs that we've had and some of the problems that we've had, and let's, let's just get right to the final status issues. 67 borders with swaps, both people get a capital in Jerusalem, no right of return on refugees, a demilitarized state. Uh, some of the settlements are going to have to be removed, and, and let's uh, put an end to this conflict. I want the President of the United States to go forward with that kind of an outline uh, and with those parameters. And there's a percentage, a small percentage in this audience that agrees, but there's a very large percentage of Jewish Americans who aren't in this room and, and who don't necessarily get to agree with that. And I think that our elected officials deserve to hear that. They have a right to know that because in setting American foreign policy, they shouldn't be acting under the presumption that there's some kind of a unity that doesn't exist and that the silence of those who agree with me over the last 20, 30 years is somehow taken to mean our assent with the views that have been presented on our behalf. 
And so I, I think that this new paradigm with multiple voices better reflects uh, the Jewish community and it's a better representation of who we are uh, and, and it's better for American democracy and better for American foreign policy. Probably just two more questions, one for each. So this is for Daniel. Uh, and actually something you alluded to already. Young American Jews are becoming disconnected from Israel. And the question says, do you a right-wing government, right-wing governments? They cannot identify, they cannot, do the right-wing governments they cannot identify with. How do you respond to that? Young American Jews are becoming disconnected from Israel, and the right-wing governments that they cannot identify with are simply the excuse, not the reason. Young American Jews are becoming disconnected from Israel because Judaism in America is undergoing a profound transformation. It is moving away from being a people and moving more towards being just, I use that word in parentheses, in, in quotation marks, just a religion. Religions don't have states. There's no Methodist state. There's no Baptist state. There's no Lutheran state. There are countries where the leadership happens to be Lutheran, like in Scandinavia, but there's no state where the Baptists say that's the place that we care about. Religions don't have states. Peoples have states. Tibetans want a state. Chechnyans want a state. Basques want a state. Palestinians want a state. For 2,000 years, Jews wanted a state. Those groups all want states because they are peoples, not because they are religions. Now, because of a whole complicated array of reasons, Jews in America are beginning to redefine themselves, not as a people, but as a religion. Partly because of intermarriage, which is both a cause and an effect, in other words, the more that you have people who are not Jewish in your family, um, the, 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 the harder it is to bridge a peoplehood kind of gap. You can easily bridge a, a religious gap. She has her holidays, I have my holidays. She has her church, I have my synagogue. She has her this, I have my that. That's fine. But if I'm part of a people, and she's not part of a people, that's a gap, so what I want to do is downplay that and actually talk about Judaism as more a religion. And then, of course, once there are more people like that in the Jewish community, then the whole religion thing comes to the surface. The people who think slips to the back. And therefore, once we're not a people, why do I need this country? That embarrasses me, that frustrates me, that makes me crazy, that makes demands on me, that speaks in a language that they tried to teach me that I never really learned. It's a whole very complicated thing. Uh, it's a sad thing because it's a profound transformation of Judaism, but I actually don't think Judaism can survive. What has made Judaism great over the years is its peopleness. The very first verse in which anybody, in which the Exodus story begins is when Paro says, Behold this people, the children of Israel, and so on and so forth. So American Jews are turning away in a younger generation from Israel, not because of right-wing governments, because of all, or they're turning away from America when it has a Republican government. You don't turn away from something that you love because it elected people that you happen not to like. Americans managed to be patriots both in times of democratic, Republican, democratic administrations and Republican administrations. If your love of Israel is so thin that a right-wing government makes you not love it anymore, I personally would not be, want to be in a loving relationship of that sort with anything or anyone at any time. The other thing, of course, that's happening is that more and more American Jews have lost the sense of otherness, and this is actually a great thing, have lost the sense of otherness in American culture, and they feel very much a part of the American people. My grandparents, and even my parents, understood that while America was unbelievably beneficent to them, they were still not the norm in America. And therefore, they had no problem feeling like they were part of the Jewish people, because as much as America welcomed them, Plymouth Rock and the Alamo and... The, and, and uh, you know, uh, the Boston part of the Boston Harbor, all those places as important as they were in the American narrative were not the same thing as Jericho and crossing the Jordan River and Jerusalem. The narratives spoke differently. To a younger Jewish generation, and uh, the cheering section is not going to like this, but hold your booze. To a, younger Jew to a younger Jewish generation, which does not know those stories as well as it ought to, it's very hard to relate to the peoplehood idea of Israel. Here is one of the things having nothing to do with the Israeli-Arab conflict. I think you're going to agree with this, but I don't know. But I can, I'm convinced that the following proposition is absolutely true. The wealthiest, most politically secure, most culturally invested, most secularly educated Jewish community that the Jewish people has ever known, which is yours, has produced the most Jewishly illiterate and unknowing Jewish generation that the Jewish people has ever known. That, that is an unbelievable tragedy. It's an unbelievable tragedy that millions of Jews made their way to this country just about a century ago and would never have imagined 
that their great-grandchildren would know virtually nothing of the tradition that they fled Europe to try to save. What's at stake in Jewish education is not only Zionism, but Zionism is part of it. People will not feel part of a people about which they can say nothing intelligent. And if they don't feel part of a people, they won't want to support its country. Bibi Netanyahu is just the hook on, whom they, on which they hang their hat. I don't love Bibi any more than a lot of those other people love Bibi, but I love Israel and I love my people. And there are going to be governments that I care for and governments that I don't care for, but through thick and thin, I'm going to stand with what I believe because I understand at the end of the day, that's what real love is and that's what real commitment is. So the chairman has chosen to respond to that uh, question also. So, and this, this, uh, this, will be, uh, this will be our last word. So I just, I just want to uh, say that there is an element of what Daniel's saying that I do agree with. And I do think that there is a uh, tragic uh, lack of education among Jewish kids today. And it extends to my own circle, in my own synagogue, in my own life. Uh, in terms of the depth and the richness of, of Jewish tradition and learning. And I do think that that's a problem, and I think it's something we do agree on. But I would disagree just on the fundamental premise of, of your response to the question, because what does motivate the young, non-Orthodox Jewish kids that, that I know and that I deal with uh, is the sense of the values on which they are raised. Uh, now, you are going to say that those are not necessarily as much Jewish values necessarily as universalist. Right. The the values that many younger Jewish children, non-Orthodox Jewish children, grow up with are values that they look to the state of Israel as the place where they hope to find their embodiment. They hope that the state of the Jewish people is going to live up to the values of the Jewish people on which they have been raised. And one of the toughest things to swallow is to watch the way in which the state of the Jewish people is dealing with the treatment of the Palestinian people today. And that is a deep challenge for the values and the principles on which we are raising our kids in this country. That we don't treat other people the way that we wouldn't want to be treated ourselves. That we believe in justice, we believe in truth, we believe in equality. These are the values on which so many of our kids are being raised as the central core of what it means to them to be part of the Jewish people. And then they're told they can't even question whether or not what's happening in Israel is in accordance with those values. And that, when the disconnect starts to happen. It has a lot more to do with whether or not they're asked to check those values, as, as Peter uh, Beinart has written, whether they're asked to stop asking the questions, to stop having the conversation, as it does with the actual behavior itself. So I don't pin it on one government. I don't pin it on the right-wing government. I actually pin it on the way that we conduct the conversation in this country within our own established communities as one of the fundamental reasons why kids are pulling back and disengaging. And it's not just from the state of Israel, but it's from the, the Jewish community as a whole. Okay. Uh, uh, that's a good way to end. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank uh, both of our participants, Jeremy, Benami, Dan Nagoyas. Thank all of you. As as uh, we've as been mentioned many times, there are books that you can buy and they can be signed. Um, so uh, Jeremy and Daniel are going to be leaving through the kitchen. They're going to show up uh, magically, I guess, uh, <laughs> uh, behind the table where the books are. We're going to form a line in the center aisle if you're interested in purchasing a book, having it signed, or or just ha if you have a book and like to have it signed. Thanks very much. Good night. <laughs>